Thanks and everybody, you're all very welcome. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Dublin Bay Biosphere, a very tiny amount. Um, obviously, east coast of Ireland, one of the few biospheres with a capital city at its heart. Um, it covers an area of, uh, from, from Hoth all the way down to Dorky. I don't know if you know the area. It's worth checking this out on the map. We have um, 330,000 people living within our biosphere. And we're one of only two biospheres within Ireland, but we're hoping that will have more biospheres around the country um, in the near future. And maybe you could put uh, the word out to maybe see if we can get some in your local communities as we've got people from all over Ireland. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? So Eleanor, maybe you'll tell us a little bit more about biospheres. Yes, I will. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Uh, and just to let everyone know, I've actually turned off the chat for the time being, but if you have questions, you can put them into the Q&A box. And we'll try and answer some at the end. So hopefully my screen is sharing now and that's our welcome slide. So I am Eleanor and I work at the Kerry Biosphere Reserve, which is the, the, oh, the other biosphere reserve apart from the Dublin Bay one, as Dean mentioned. And they're UNESCO Biosphere Reserves. So when we say a biosphere reserve, what we're talking about is an area that is designated for a really specific reason. So if there's always an element of nature conservation, because obviously the environment is very, very important, but it's not just about nature. A biosphere reserve is also relating to the people that live there, that use the land for their livelihoods, all of the businesses that are operating in the area, and how we might use that area for recreation or our own well-being as well. So we like to say there are places where nature and culture interact. And there's all about sustainable development. So trying to use the environment in a way that makes sure there's an, it, it's looked after well and there's plenty of it left for us in future generations. So I've said UNESCO a few times. And just to clean, clear, clarify that for you, the UNESCO stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. So biosphere reserves, as I said, have an element of nature conservation. So they're what we call the core areas. And in both of our biosphere reserves in Dublin Bay and in Kerry, our core areas are what we call protected areas. So there's really important habitats and species that are, exist there. And we're trying to look after those. And then around those, we have buffer zones. Buffer zones is where we can use the area, but in a way that's sustainable. So in a way that helps look after that nature that's in the core area. And in the transition zone is where we start to see people living. So that's where we have our businesses, our houses, our schools, and where we start to learn about the nature that we're trying to protect in the middle. So as Dale said, there's two in Ireland. Worldwide, there's actually 714. We've got the Dublin Bay over on the East Coast and Kerry down in the West. So the Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve loosely put, is around this area. Dean gave us a fantastic introduction to it just a minute ago. It's a coastal biosphere reserve, so it's got some amazing marine habitats. And there's lots of different activities that take place there, like huge businesses like Dublin Port, there's ferries coming in, and there's also Bull Island, which is a protected area for several different bird species. So it's a really exciting place to work and to live. And in Kerry, we're actually a mountain biosphere. So we're right in the center of Kerry here, around the McGillicuddy Reeks and the Lakes of Killarney. So here's a close-up map of the, the Kerry biosphere, and you can see we don't have a coastline in our biosphere, but we do have lots of lakes. We've got amazing woodlands in Killarney, and we've got Ireland's highest mountain range and Ireland's highest mountain, Cairn Tool, right in the center there as well. So that's enough about biosphere reserves. We're going to hand over to Dale, who is going to teach us all about pollinators. And of course, pollinators are super important in every habitat. So we're very excited to have you with us today, today Dale. Boys and girls and teachers. Now, for the last couple of weeks, I've been saying mums and dads and carers as well, so now we've all been homeschooling. There might be a couple of people still cocooning homeschooling as well. Hello to you but I'm pretty sure most everybody is back, which is fantastic. I know my boy, he went back on Monday and he was delighted. And I think you all saw him on Monday afternoon or Tuesday if you watched it in school on News Today when they went to St. Kieran's National School. So it suggests that you were all heading back to school. My lad was the lad who said he was very excited to be back, but didn't sound very excited to be back. Anyway, boys and girls, for the last couple of weeks, we've been doing things on the first week was birds and bats. Our last week, for those who were with us, was on hedgehogs and other mammals. Those two webinars, 
if you miss them, are up on the Kerry Biosphere YouTube channel. So you can watch them again at any stage into the future. Today, though, we're looking at pollinators. Now, the first thing we're going to figure out is what is a pollinator? Pollinators are animals and insects which take pollen from one flower to another. So in order for that plant to be able to produce seeds. Those seeds might be enclosed in fruit, or nuts, or berries, and they're things which, as people, we eat. So pollinators are extremely important. Now, I mentioned boys and girls with a funny voice like mine in the last couple of weeks. I'm not from Ireland at all. I grew up in Australia, and in Australia, we have some very different pollinators than they have here in Europe. Many of our birds are called honey eaters, and their pollinators and flowers in Australia, where I grew up, are very different often than flowers here in Ireland. They often have very vast amounts of nectar inside them, and are very red in colour to attract isolated birds. Sometimes we have creatures such as sugar glide and honey possum, and other mammals like fruit bats, which help pollinate. But in Ireland, your pollinators are insects. Things like bees, things like butterflies, things which we don't think about, like moths. There's actually lots more species of moths than any amount of species of bees or butterflies. About 1,400 species of moths. Also, insects, such as ladybird beetles, can help pollinate. Other beetles pollinate. And there's flies which pollinate too, such as hoverflies and other flies. So there's a whole range of different creatures which help pollinate plants. And without plant pollination, our food source would be pretty boring. So pollinators are super, super, duper, duper important. And I'm going to spend a bit of time today in a fun way trying to show you in the confines of my Zoom, which, by the way, behind me, you can see what my garden out the window of my Zoom room looks like in the middle of summer. And we're going to do it by way of showing some videos, which I've pre-made here. Some videos which were made a number of years ago when I looked a lot younger on RT Junior. And also some stories and some activities and some things I want to show you. Now, for those who've been with me in the past, I normally kick things off with the story. This week, we're going to do things differently. I'm going to show you some information first, do some, show you some cool things which I brought from outside, and then I'm going to do the story. Because the story is a bit different this time as well. It won't be me doing the story. But first of all, to kick things over, boys and girls and teachers, let us do a little screen share where I have to, first of all, check this one on the big screen, hope that she comes up well. It's all black and dark at the moment. Is that right on the big screen, Eleanor and Dean? Fantastic, Dale. Yeah. And it says pollinators. Off we go. Final area. This is our area where we've got loads and loads of insects in the air, Nathan. Things like butterflies and bees and hoverflies. And we've even got our little bee hotel beside us for the solitary bees to have homes in. Boys and girls, I like to not catch our butterflies and bees i like to sit and watch them and seeing them doing their role which is pollinating taking pollen from one flower to another one so that we have nuts fruits berries and other crops can you see that one there nathan yeah now we're going to have a quick little look why pollinators are so important. So have a look at this little animation from the National Biodiversity Centre. Bees are crucial for agriculture, food production and the economy. So what's the buzz about bees? Bees visit flowers to drink nectar and collect pollen, bringing back to feed to the baby bees. As a bee gathers pollen, it also moves pollen from flower to flower, kick-starting the production of seeds and new plants. This is pollination, and we need bees to pollinate lots of our fruits and vegetables, wildflowers and flowering trees. 
In Ireland, we have one species of honeybee, 21 bumblebee species, and 77 solitary bees. Contrary to popular belief, it's actually our wild bees, bumblebees and solitary bees, who are responsible for most pollination. The honeybee usually lives in a hive managed by humans. There could be thousands of honeybees in one hive. Our 21 Irish bumblebees come in many different colours and sizes. When the queen bumblebee emerges from hibernation in spring, she first has to feed before she finds a nest site. She must visit thousands of flowers a day just to gather enough energy to brood her first batch of eggs. That's a lot of work. A queen bumblebee usually makes its nest in long grass or sometimes in old abandoned mouse burrows. A bumblebee colony is much smaller than a honeybee's, with anything from about 40 to 250 bumblebees in a nest. The female workers collect all the pollen for the colony, so they need lots of wildflowers to feed on. Only the newly mated bumblebee queen survive the winter by burrowing into north-facing banks to hibernate. As the name suggests, solitary bees do not live in social communities, like bumblebees or honeybees. In Ireland, there are 77 different types of solitary bees. 62 of them are mining bees that dig out their nests in bare ground in south or east facing banks. 15 of them are cavity nesters that live in existing cavities in south facing wood or stone. After mating, the female then finds a suitable nest to lay her eggs. In each chamber, she leaves a pollen loaf for the larva to eat when it hatches out. When she's laid about 20 eggs, she seals the nest and leaves. Only the larvae of the solitary bees survive over the winter, and when they emerge, they go their separate ways. Pollination is crucial for food production and for our wild flowering plants. But unfortunately in Ireland, our bee species have undergone substantial decline since the 1980s. We've already lost two bee species through extinction, and one third of our 98 wild bee species are now in serious risk. But the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan is here to help reverse these declines. This plan identified 81 evidence-based actions across public and private land that will create an Ireland where pollinators can survive and thrive. The aim is to create a network of pollinator-friendly habitats to bring back that food and shelter that is now missing from the landscape. If we want to help our bees help us produce crops, there are a few simple things that we can do to make Ireland more pollinator-friendly. In short, bees need pollen-rich flowers in bloom from early spring right through to late autumn. We've produced a series of guidelines explaining how you can help. There are also lots of resources and tips on our website, as well as how-to guides to help you get busy and do your part. So in Ireland, we've nearly 99 different species of bees. And of course, the one we know most of all is the honeybee. So join me at a visit to one of my neighbor's honeybee hives from way, way back when we did shows on Kazoo on the Den. Hey, we're going to look at some honeybees and their hives. Of all the thousands of different kinds of bees there are, honeybees are the only bees which produce honey in a way which is productive enough for us. So we're gonna look at the hives, we're gonna see all the different bees which are happening there. There's bees in this hive, there's the queen bee, there's the drones, and there's the workers. And the workers do all the work and go out foraging. So we're gonna be having a look at them. We'll see more of them up close, but before that, I better put on my bee suit. The bees here are very lucky because when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they get to do for breakfast is to sneak out into this traditional meadow. Behind me here is a collection of flowers like cornflowers, poppies, sweet peas, and they're full of nectar for the bees to get first thing in the morning before they have to travel too far. Foraging bees travel huge distances looking for nectar from flowers. They can travel up to six miles. That's about the equivalent of you and I flying from Kerry to Donegal. And they do this maybe 10 times a day. When they get to the flower, they stick their proboscis in. They suck up the nectar. 
They also rub their bodies over with pollen and they can bring back their own weight in pollen and nectar back to the hive to feed to the larvae. Believe it or not, they actually go to 50 million flowers just to make up one pint of honey. When they get back, you'll notice the foraging bees coming from a distance will have pollen sacs on them. They do a little dance. When they're doing this dance, they tell all the other bees the direction of the nectar source. Just at the moment, their dance, which is in relation to the sun, is telling them that they are going due east from here to a place called the gum tree cottage. Down here, the place is full of flowers, things like sunflowers and buddleias and wildflowers and even vegetables which have gone to seed. Because of this, the honeybees have come in to get more nectar to take back to the hive. As well as honeybees, we have other pollinators like hoverflies and ladybirds and bumblebees. Early in the year, guys, we we're looking at uh, bees, both honeybees and bumblebees. Honeybees and bumblebees, they're leader species, they're very important because they're pollinators. Unfortunately for ourselves here in Ireland and all over the world, bee numbers are dropping very quickly and very rapidly. There's a number of different factors why this is happening, but things we can do to improve the situation for bees is to plant loads more nectar flowers, like the sunflowers here and all the flowers behind me. We can also provide loads of overwintering habitat for solitary bees like bumblebees bees like providing bug boxes and even making little holes along hedges to act just like little mouse holes for the bees to hibernate in. So guys get out there and keep working. Now boys and girls let's come back a little bit more recently. This summer my own son and I Nathan we made some bee houses for solitary bees. Join us now. Hi there my name's Dale Treadwell and I'm a Heritage in the Schools expert and this is my son Nathan. Hello. Nathan is going to help me today because today we're building homes for solitary bees. In Ireland we have some 98 different species of bees. We have a honeybee, which we not get honey from, and we have some honeybees here last year in the garden, and they're now in a hive which one of our neighbours have. We have 20 odd different bumblebees, and we have also solitary bees. And solitary bees are 77 different species of them. Some of them live in homes in cavities and in wall spaces and we can create homes for them to uh, for them to have their larvae have more bees next year so Nathan you're going to give me a hand doing that I have a bit of birch here Nathan okay. this would have been one of our fire logs but we've got lots of fire logs so we don't need that one so what I'm going to get you to do for me Nathan is I'm going to get you to drill some holes for me with the battery drill I'll hold on to the birch and you drill down go for it Excellent. bring it up again Go again, another hole. Bring it up. And another one there. Okay. Excellent job. Now we've finished doing all the holes. What we need to do is we need to rub it off with some sandpaper. And the reason we do that is so that the solitary bees can go in without damaging their wings. Now we've done a few different holes of different sizes. We'll find somewhere to put that in a minute. Another way, if you don't have bits of timbers like that, I did some trimming of some of their buddleys or butterfly bushes this year, and they're great because what they do is they've got little hollows which are already there, and if the hollows aren't quite there for us, we can make them up again. So I'll hang on to this one so that nobody gets hurt. Go all the way in, go all the way out. And what we have to do, we've got an old, I think these had baked beans in them. We like baked beans here. What we have to do is we've got to put all the other twigs all in there and create lots of little holes. So off you go. It's a little bit pick up sticks. Pop them all in. Go for it. So whilst Nathan's doing that, there's a query. Could you make the screen full screen? Could you increase the size of the video, please? Yeah. This particular one with passes. Great Still job. Well done, buddy. We'll have to go find a home for them now. Now, we have to find places for them to go. And the best spot is a south-facing windowsill because it's in underneath the cover here so they'll be protected from the weather and it's south-facing so this is the best direction for the bees to come. So find a home for that one. And also that one. Job well done. 
Wow, there was loads of stuff on bees, but there are other pollinators like butterflies and moths. So will you join me in my garden from a number of years ago with, when my daughter was actually with me back then. She's now 19. I think she was only about nine then for a day on kazoo called the Butterfly Day. Girls, come have a look here. Out here at the Gumtree Cottage, we've loads of butterflies today. It's a great butterfly flight day because there's no wind and it's really sunny. So we've red admirals, we've also peacocks, and I think we might have ourselves a little tortoiseshell. Now, the reason why we've got so many butterflies here today is we've loads of flowers. Butterflies have a full life cycle where they start from an egg, then they're a caterpillar, then they're a chrysalis, then they turn into a butterfly. When they're a butterfly, they need loads of energy. So they go from flower to flower, like this buddleia. It's also called a butterfly bush. When they lay their eggs, they lay their eggs on plants which, well, maybe are a little bit on the nastier side. Things like stinging nettles. And the large whites lay their eggs on. Who knows what large whites lay their eggs on? Sometimes we eat them. Things like... Cabbages. Ca cabbages. <laughs> Fantastic. In Ireland, there are around 30 different species of butterflies. The ones which we've seen today have been red admirals, peacocks, painted ladies, large whites, and tortoise shells. Now, if it's raining, butterflies like this peacock will try to get in out of the cover because if it's raining too much, their wings will get a bit damp and they won't be able to fly around as far. So you'll often find them in the rain, hiding amongst hedges or hiding amongst the leaves in trees there like that. Guys, all around me here is a mix of seeds which you can use to attract butterflies. It's a mixture of plants like uh, California poppies, poppies, oxeye daisies, and all of these will flower all the way from March, April, all the way through to August. So you'll have a supply of butterfly nectar all the way through the summer months. <gasps> well done. Girls, we've done fantastic catching loads of butterflies and learning all about their habitats and what they need so we can have loads more. Wow. Now, boys and girls, just to recap on a couple of things there while I've got you back because we're on the halfway mark and we need a stretch. When we were talking about honeybees, we said when they got back from finding a source of flowers, they did a little dance to show all the other worker bees where to go. That's called a waggle dance. We can all do a waggle dance as well. So I need you to waggle for me. And the best thing about a waggle dance is I've got one of these spinny chairs. Yay! You can waggle backwards and waggle backwards again. Perhaps not unless you've got a spinny chair, otherwise you might fall off. I said that we should get out there and get working, didn't I? I should have changed that word way, way back then, but back then they wouldn't let me do edits in RT. I should have said, get buzzing. And you saw me with Nathan making a solitary bee hotel. Now, I was outside just before and I brought in one of these solitary bee hotels. Now, I wasn't sure how good that would look on this. That looks good to me. I won't need to use my extra, extra camera. Can we see where the holes have been drilled? And uh, can we see the holes which have been drilled, which have got, it looks like they're filled with cement or sand, doesn't it? They're the caps where a solitary bee has cap because back inside are all those little um, capsules with different larvae with pollen in. And they'll hatch around May and emerge for the next life cycle of solitary bees. Speaking of life cycle, because I know teachers are always interested in this, because I know in the junior classes, we often do things, I've got to change a couple of my shares. We often do frogs and butterflies. But as we get into third and fourth class and fifth and sixth class, then it'd be good to do more life cycle stuff that may be a little bit more complicated. Now, I was out and around this week because it's been sunshiny, particularly on Paddy's Day, wasn't it? It was probably the best we've had for about 10 years. And I went walking around my garden and I saw loads of emerging 
bumblebees. Now, bumblebees have a bit of a complicated life cycle, as we can see here. Most bumblebee queens come out of their hibernation for early spring, which is about now. Some types of bumblebees are very fussy eaters and they like to feed on flowers that grow in grassland meadows. So these bumblebees have to wait until the early summer before they come out of hibernation so that grassland flowers will be there when they wake up. So here we are, here we are in spring. The queen bee, she wakes up from hibernation. She's been asleep all winter because it's too cold and there's not enough flowers for her to get any food from. Now she has a big feed. That's why it's very important there's flowers at this time of year. I know I've been seeing the bumblebees go into some emerging dandelion. We've got lots of plants called salandine and also hyacinths. Some hyacinths might sun planted when he was just in kindergarten or everywhere. So they're getting a good feed from this and they find a good place to make their own. They make a pollen loaf, which is food for their babies and a nectar pot, which is a snack for themselves to keep them going. And then she starts laying eggs. The next stage is these eggs grow into female worker bees, mates overlooking after their nest. Their main job is to collect pollen and bring it back to feed all the growing larvae. In mid to late summer, the queen lays more eggs. Some will grow into male bees and some into new queens. These new queens and male bees leave the nest and go out to find new mates. The new queen, she eats lots of food late in the autumn and she gets ready for a long winter sleep. The male bees, female workers and the old queen bee can come to the end of their life. So in the next year, it's just that new queen bumblebee. Solitary bees are even more complicated because they go through a couple of seasons. In the spring, it's normally later spring, so um, April, May, the females and the male bees wake up. Remember that little video? Once they've found a mate, the female bee then goes off to find a nest. Remember a little video we saw the female bees laying eggs and leaving a supply of food for the new babies to feed on when they hatch in the autumn? The old male and female bees then die off. The, the eggs become larvae. And over the course of period of uh, now, when it starts warming up, those larvae hatch and they start eating the food which their mother has left behind. The larvae, after they're big enough to feed down, settle down. And the following year, they sleep through winter. And then they emerge, the females and males emerge and wake up from hibernation again. So it's not just important to have flowers for this year, it's also important to provide habitat and food for, for uh, and habitat for bees to nest in. For bumblebees, it's often in the form of old mouse holes and alike. For the solitary bee, it's making things like uh, for the cavity nesters, little wood blocks like I showed you there, and all, and for the um, for the mining bees, it's to leave areas which are sort of a, a, a blank roadside verges and stuff like that of, of bare soil. But that just sort of on our halfway mark is stuff to do with bees. When I stop this share now, and we're going to look at some things to do with butterflies. But to do butterflies, I told you I have a new story. Now, the story I wrote, but far better than me reading the story, I am going to get one of those little girls, which is in the butterfly video, to read you that story. I'm just checking with Dean that that little girl who's now a much bigger girl is on the big screen there, Dean. Yep, perfect. Thanks, Dale. Fantastic. Because when she was little, she did that film with me, Catching Butterflies in the Garden. But now she's a lot bigger. I'll get her to read the new book, which is called Patricia, the Painted Lady Butterfly.
girls welcome back again and now i've got a very special treat for you i'm going to read a story that isn't published yet and you guys are the first to hear it so here we go this is called patricia the painted lady goes on an amazing journey patricia stretches her wings as they need to dry with the help of the soft atlantis mountain winds after a nourishing drink of nectar from a desert wildflower Patricia flutters up, up, up into the sky to begin a miraculous journey all the way to the green countryside of Ireland. This dangerous journey in the jet stream may take several days. Patricia and millions of other leaf-sized butterflies cross over dry red lands, blue oceans and through turbulent storms until Patricia lands safely in a garden full of flowers and most importantly a small wild corner of nettle docks, what meadow grasses and shrubs. Alighting at a buddleia bush, Patricia meets Reginald, a splendid red admiral butterfly. Reginald is pleased this garden has nettles and pellitory for his caterpillars to eat. Patricia drinks the energy rich nectar from the buddleia, which makes her feel much better after her long journey. But it is not Reginald Patricia has come to meet. So she flutters off to the next flower. Softly landing on a sunflower, Patricia is greeted by Barry the Brimstone, a dashing butter yellow butterfly. The nectar from the sunflower tastes delicious. Barry is delighted that this garden has alder buckthorn shrubs for his caterpillars to feed on, but it is not Barry that Patricia has come all this way to meet so she flutters to the flower nearby. Settling on a sedum plant, Patricia says hello to Peter the peacock. Peter is a butterfly, adorned with striking colours to warn off predators. Peter is pleased that this garden has nettles for his caterpillars to eat. The sweet nectar of the sedum is much appreciated by Patricia and Peter, but it is not Peter who Patricia has come all this way to meet. So she flutters off towards another flower. Halting next to Henry the holly blue butterfly in a suit of blue sweat, Patricia shares the nectar of some mint. Henry is happy that this garden has holly shrubs so that his caterpillars will have food to munch on. However, it is not Henry that Patricia has come all this way to greet, so she leaves him to look for another flower. Landing on some lavender, Patricia is welcomed by Tommy the tortoiseshell butterfly. He is dapper as always. After they take, both take their fill of nectar, Tommy is tickled pink that his garden has nettles so that his caterpillars will be able to grow big and strong. Alas, it is not Tom that Patricia has come all this way to meet, so off she flutters to find more garden flowers. Settling next to Stephen the speckled wood butterfly on some verbena, Patricia samples some more nectar. Stephen is grateful that this garden has a patch of meadow grasses, which would be a wonderful food source for his caterpillars. Still, Patricia is not happy, as it is not Stephen who she's come on this long journey to see. She flaps her wings graciously and continues her search. Pausing at a cone flower, Patricia places herself near Connor, the small copper butterfly. The cone flower is a favourite source of nectar for Patricia, as it is similar to flowers back in the desert. Connor is chuffed too that this garden has dock leaves and sorrel for his caterpillars to feed from. Sadly, it is not Connor that Patricia wishes to visit. Once more, she spreads her delicate wings, hoping that this time she will find what she seeks. Patricia has been to many nectar-rich flowers and is now feeling much better. Her journey is far from over. Suddenly she spies another buddleia bush. This bush has endless golden flowers and branches which are plentiful. She flies and lands beside Paul, who is another painted lady butterfly. Paul has kindly saved a special place for her next to him. Patricia and Paul fly across to the wild patch of thistles, burdock and mugwort, where Patricia can lay her eggs which will soon hatch into caterpillars. The caterpillars will crunch and munch, eventually transforming into chrysalides. 
After a long rest, they will emerge to make the miraculous journey back over faraway lands and oceans to the deserts of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Thank you, Leah. <gasps> now, boys and girls, I want to show you something else from that book. It's the information pages, because if you remember from Harry and Robbie, they were gardening books about gardening, and they had loads of facts as well. Well, the Patricia book will have facts too. And the main fact that I want to talk about is the miraculous migration of the painted lady butterfly. Because it's only very, very recently, thanks to new technology and radar equipment, that the migration of the leaf side painted lady butterflies from all the way from the Atlas Mountains to Morocco in northern Africa to northern Europe has been discovered. It's one of these little miracles of nature. And the only reason we know about it is because when they had these new radar equipment, they were looking to see what stealth bombers were out there. And they knew the Americans weren't flying that day. And the Russians can't afford stealth bombers yet. So <laughs> they figured that it had to be these painted lady butterflies. And what's even more incredible, as well as being pushed up with, if you like, the jet stream all the way up into Northern Europe over a number of different sections of life cycles, is that at the end of the season, around September, sometimes when we see the painted ladies heading back, this only really happens once every half a dozen years or so, they manage to make it back again. And that's incredible because it's one of the longest migrations for only an insect of that size. And what's amazing about it is it's done over water as well. Now, what I'm really keen for people to do is to make their own butterfly garden and bee gardens and creating a butterfly garden is a fantastic little project to involve children with. I uh, try planting loads of cool plants like buddleias and the beaners and sedums for late in the year, but I also like having lots of things early in the year like different bulbs and celandines and I like and you can try some interesting little features like a hibernation house, rockeries for warmth, shallow water dishes. I use things like recycled lids from old washing machines. And what's most important is to allow wild patches in our garden of meadow grasses, nettles and docks and thistles. Because we might have mentioned before that many of the caterpillars of the butterflies eat nettles and docks and thistles. So a little bit of the chicken and the egg without these plants, which we commonly call weeds for the caterpillars to eat, we can't have adult butterflies. And these caterpillars are very important too because they form parts of food chain. They mightn't always make it to uh, adulthood because they get eaten by other things like birds. And at this time of year, the birds are looking for food sources from insects and caterpillars to feed their own chicks. Now, boys and girls, I want to do another screen share or three. Now, this is going to be a little on the messy side because I was hoping that I wouldn't have to show lots of individual screen shares, but it looks like I might have them. Um, it didn't work for me. I want to give you some ideas of school garden. This is one I did in a place called Moy Vore, which is out in County West Mead, almost on the border of Longford. Now it's a cool little garden that has areas for touch, for sound, for sight, and lots of activities like banging <gasps> the xylophones and stuff like that to make noise. Let's see if we can find another one of those. Sight pictures, where's the sight? big red poppies and in the back there is a plant called teasel. I love teasel. Teasel they used to use actually um, the seed heads to tease the darn from uh, from wool for, 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 for wool. Now 
I'm going to show you another one from another part of the world. This is this is School Breacher, not School Breacher in Edenderry. I know they're not very far away from me because I live in a place called Ballinabracky. But this is School Breacher in Leakslip. And there's a meadow I did for them a number of years ago. That's lovely, isn't it? And it's full of food for pollinators. So, Dave, whilst you're showing those images, um, if anyone has any questions for you, they Absolutely can put them in the Q and A section, and we'll ask you some questions in about five minutes. Now, about five minutes time, I'm going to do one more screen share of things, which is not actually some photographs. I'm actually going to buy a copy of a book, which is a free download. Um, it's also done by Juanita Brown, who is involved in lots of national biodiversity kind of things. And Juanita Brown used to do things with myself and a friend of mine, Mr. Declan Kenny, many, many years ago on a magazine called Wild Island. But anyway, this little publication, it's a garden wildlife booklet, and it's got loads of great ideas on how to do wildlife lawn patches, how to even creating a wildlife lawn area by leaving sections of the grass to grow and not cutting them and just leaving pathways in between what we can do along the verges and creating interesting little shapes. I don't know if anybody can see that. That's some longer grass in between all the shorter grass which has some flower in it. And it's just like I did a bloom garden back in 2007, which seems a long, long time ago now. And all of these ideas are in the how to guide from the pollinator plan. And there's a fantastic little booklet which we're looking at before for the life cycle of bees called the Junior Pollinator Plan, which is also a free download. So here are a couple of my favorite flowers, which we can have out for spring, summer, autumn and winter. And of course, a couple of my real favorite ones like Hebe's and sunflowers. Hebe's is a great name. It reminds me of Hebe Jeeves. A little inlet on creating our very fly borders and something very simple, even if they're having a lot of space, it's just great loads of And again, all this can be found in the All Island Pollinator Plan at pollinators.ie, including creating nesting zones for solitary bees. And as I mentioned before, the most important thing is to leave an untidy corner. Sometimes we have to st stop judging things by what we think is tidy and neat and think about what is best for wildlife. Lovely stuff. It's that time of day, I think. Dave, I get to field some questions. Dave, thanks very much. First of all, I want to say um, the story. My goodness, it's fantastic. Uh, it's a really good story. Now, I know it isn't published yet, Hobie, because I, I have little people here who would love to listen to that story. A bedtime because that time we read Better stuff read stuff. by my daughter Leah. And I'll <laughs> let everybody know and teachers you can actually hear that story again by my daughter Leah on the National Play Day um, YouTube videos which were produced last summer. Um, yeah, that and Harry the Hedgehog and Robbie the Robin. Um, but you get a little bit of overlay music yeah. with that, which would have been good on the webinar. No doubt. Um, when I asked if, if we could get some questions in, uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's, there's a load of questions coming in and they're really good questions. I'm going to start with this one because you'll like this one, Dale. It's from Michael Malloy and he says, um, does Dale come out to schools? And if so, how do we make contact? Um, Interested in creating a farm? And I know you've created in, in just in my area in Dunleary, so maybe you can tell us a little bit. The best way to that. get hold of myself when we're allowed back into 
schools to go visit you, hopefully in the autumn of next year, is through the Heritage in the Schools program. I'm one of their heritage officers. In fact, that little video of myself and Nathan making that solitary bee hotel, that's on the Heritage in the Schools website in amongst their tutorials. On um, both Harry book and Robbie book, previously been published, but I'm unlikely to put into print again. They're both on that website as free downloads as well. Fantastic. <clears throat> Fantastic. And, and I know some schools have applied for funding through um, the old local agenda 21 environment protection fund. So there's opportunities there. And then some schools have their own budget. So if they wanted to contact you directly, they can do that. Absolutely. And booking me through the Heritage and Schools scheme is generally the um the best way to do it because it's a subsidized program as well okay. for schools. But um, um at the moment we're not allowed to physically come into school for all the obvious reasons, but that will that will eventually come. Okay, Dale, there's another question here. This one's from Carol Scales, and she asks, how many species of butterflies there? I know you mentioned about bees. I wonder if you know how many butterflies there are. Yeah, it's just over the 30 mark. I think it was, what was it, 32 or 34? 32. I can't remember off the top of my hand, but yeah. it's over the 30 mark. But over 30 mark, just in Ireland? Just within Ireland, wow, yeah. Wow, that's Sorry. amazing. Worldwide, there's um, um, thousands of different species of thousands. butterflies. In fact, if you go into tropical areas, you find much, much more um, because there's a lot more diversity. Um, unfortunately, again, in tropical areas, that's becoming less and less too because of people's influence. But within Ireland, I think we're just over the 30 mark. Okay. Um, Ellen, have you got a question there? Yeah, just to follow up on that last one about the butterfly species, third class in Monksland National School would like to know what is the rarest butterfly in Ireland? What is the rarest one? Wow, Dean will know a little bit about this too. One of, one of the rarest species of butterfly is a butterfly called the brimstone butterfly. Now the brimstone butterfly is actually where they think the butterfly got its name originally from. Because it is buttery low colour. Many years ago I did a big project for Dean. I planted, I can't, can't remember how I, mean, I know I dug a lot of holes <laughs> of this plant called the alder buckthorn. Now, the alder buckthorn normally grows in fens and alike, which is a particular habitat, a wetland habitat um, in around from Manor and also just into, uh, across the border of the carbon. And uh, um, but I know there is brimstones here in the county of Mere. The gentleman painted a patch in Enfield of these plants many years ago. And every now and again, I see them um, because a few of these plants in my garden. Dale, um, okay, so here's an interesting one. Um, it's from Bonnie Leonard, why do bees sting you? <gasps> why do bees sting you? Right, well, here we go with a quick one. Solitary bees, the ones we were talking about making the nest, well, they can't sting you. So there's 77 different species of solitary bees, and solitary bees can't sting you. Honey can sting you, and bubble bees can sting you. Now, I've never heard of anybody being stung by bumblebees. I think you've really got to upset them really badly to uh, uh, annoy a bumblebee. And honeybees things be pretty rare considering they're around all the time because bees aren't interested in people. Bees are only interested from going from flower to flower and they only sting when they feel threatened and when they hurt. So Invariably, the, uh, normally you get stuck if you're quite close to the hive and the bees are concerned about you um, attacking their hive and hurting their larvae. But when they're out and around doing their thing, collecting, collecting pollen and nectar from flowers, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. And I can tell you this from past experience, when I was little, I took it upon myself one day to try to rescue a whole lot of bees which had landed in a swimming pool. Um, they weren't very grateful. I don't think they knew that I was helping them. 
Now, go, I just want to ask you another question before Eleanor jumps in about bees and you know you're rescuing these bees. There's something called a, a swarm. Ah. Could you explain a bit about a swarm and um, now, why yes. they swarm? Why do bees swarm? Now it's just the honeybees which swarm. Okay, bumblebees don't swarm, solitary bees don't swarm. It's the honeybees which swarm. Now I've got a picture to show you as well. This is kind of this is great. I didn't know whether I was going to get to bring this picture up. This is my garden from oh, it's a couple of summers ago. Um, now there is a swarm of bees. Now what happened here? That came up, didn't I think? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. What happened then was that one of my neighbours, who is a beekeeper, one of his hives would have had the birth of a new queen bee. Now, this is what honeybee hives do to replicate and to make more hives. And this new queen, um, there's not room enough in the hive for her, for her and her the old queen, her mother. So what happens, is generally around sort of May, June, July, this can happen during the bee season, is the new queen takes off, she flies into the air, and all the, half the, half the hive sort of disappears with her. All the male bees, or what they call drones, go off and they follow her, and they surround her and they keep her protected. And it's the beginnings of a new hive. And it often, you'll often see them uh, when they form in areas in, in, between, in little tree trunks and stuff like that. Now, what happened, um, here is my neighbour. I told him so, and he was delighted to know that um, there was a new hive forming because he came down to collect that hive uh, or collect that swarm and take them uh, to another location, not the location where they come from before, that have a new hive and my son actually went down for all of the year and he was checking on that hive all the time and looking after it and that became his pet hobby to look after his swarm of bees. Now when bees swarm like this in Ireland they're not really that um, um, threatening um, in that they they, 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 they they don't generally sting when they're in the swarm, they're more interested in um, staying all around the new queen. Um, so you can come up really close. Well, I came up close, but then again, I had a bee suit on. You shouldn't really come up that close unless you do. I don't think I would do, but yeah. Feel a little safer in a bee suit, for sure. <laughs> um, just while you're talking about the bees there, Dale, how many bees are in a hive? Sean Enright has asked. Now, it can, for a honeybee hive, I think I mentioned before in the RTE video that it could be 30, 40,000 bees within that honeybee hive. But things like bumblebees, um, their nests are only um, a maximum 100 or, so, or a couple of hundred, or so there's not that many in a bumblebee nest. Solitary bees, as you said, they are solitary. So it's just the honeybees which are in the big hive like that. And I think there was, a, there was an article which I sent off to a whole lot of beekeeper friends of mine. It was about bees. Having honeybees is all good. In fact, I've been meeting this, this evening with a tiny towns group in Ashburn, virtually like this. Uh, but I will be suggesting one thing as well. Uh, having your own farm honeybees is not quite the same as looking after wild pollinators. Uh, and in some ways, most pollination is done by wild pollinators, not by people farmed honeybees. So third and fourth class in Newtown National School ask, why do bees die after they sting you? Oh, I've seen the movie. Now, uh, bee movie, here so. we go. There's a clarification on this one. Bumblebees, if a bumblebee was to sting you, which I said they don't, Jill, they won't die. Oh, okay? So a bumblebee won't die, but a honeybee will. The reason why the honeybee will is the when the honeybee stings, it's worse for him than it is for you. It hurts you, but it's really bad for the bee because where their stinger is on the bottom part of their abdomen, they actually rip their abdomen off when they sting you. So they actually kind of rip half their body off. Um, and they can't survive that long with only half their body. Um, so it's not really good for, but it's kind of, it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, what they call a kamikaze act when they do it. They do it to protect um, the hive. That's why you, sometimes there's footage of things which uh, uh, hornets attacking 
bees in Japan are like the giant hornets. And what generally happens is the giant hornets, because they can take a whole lot of stings, they keep attacking and attacking, and eventually there's no more bees to protect the hives. That's the way the hornets get in and um, and the, the rob the bees of their honey and they, they eat all their larvae and the like too. It's a pretty graphic sort of um, thing to watch on National Geographic. It's interesting. <laughs> that sounds that sounds pretty serious. All right. Oh, luckily, we don't have any of those here at no, our... No hornets here in Ireland. <laughs> there is a beetle which looks a little bit like a hornet. I've had people ask me whether it's a hornet. It doesn't. It's a beetle, but it's not a hornet. Just to talk oh, about the it? solitary bees again, and Samantha <laughs> Crowley has asked, why do the bees burrow in certain directions? So in the video, it was talking about them burrowing in, is it south facing? Good question, good question. Uh, it's protection against the weather. It's a little bit like when you sight uh, bird nesting boxes, uh, you sight them in a particular direction so that they're not going to be getting all the oncoming winds that are like, and it's the same for, um, uh, same, same for the bees, whether they be cabin nesters or whether they be in the, whether they be mining the earth, they're wanting to go into the directions where they're not copying weather fronts and rain and stuff like that all the time. So uh, this is a, I, I don't even know whether you'll know this answer, but you know we'll ask yeah. it, and it might be one that we have to look up. But um, it's um, Sherry Bags Educate Together National School. What is the fastest bee? Oh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. To find I think out. In, in, in so many different regards, I think even when they talk about bees and things like when they look at their anatomy, particularly bumblebees that are so big and heavy, I think it's a bit of a half the time. I think it's a bit of a mystery how they can actually fly at all. Um, so no, <laughs> I have no idea what the fastest bee is. I don't know. I don't know either. But it, <laughs> so that, it's an it interesting up, thing to look I, up. I, isn't I might it? have it for next week. So Bonnie Leonard says, um, why are female butterflies always a dark colour? Is that, is that... Um... Now, okay, okay. I, I, I know where that question's coming from. Not necessarily if female butterflies are dark colour, but I, I know what folks might be talking about here. When butterflies fold their wings like that, okay, when they're upright, um, often it's dark on uh, when they're folded over. That's so that they look more like a leaf and they're not predated upon but they'll open up like so for two reasons, A, for a mate to see them, or sometimes the likes of a peacock butterfly, notice then they've got really bright colours, it looks like big eyes. So that would frighten potential predators away. That's another good thing as well, because I know we're coming just towards the end there. There's, I mentioned moths. Moths are really, really important as well. In Ireland, there are over 1,400 different species of moth, and we never talk about moth. But if you're looking at butterflies and the moths, which are day flying too, not all of them are out at night time, but a lot of plants are nighttime scented, particularly for moths at night time. But the day flying, the dip, the, an easy way to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth is when the butterfly folds his wings, he'll be like that, yeah? When the moth folds his wings, he'll be like that. And the other one is most moths, particularly ones which come out at night time, their antennae are rather feathered. That helps them find their way around. There's butterflies on and up and straight up and down. And the other cool thing about butterflies and moth, they're in a family called Lepidoptera or order Lepidoptera. And what they do when they have these extendable tongues, and it's a little bit like, you know, your, your, your party whistle, which you blow out and it goes and rolls back in again. Their extendable tongues are a bit like that, and that's how they collect um, uh, the, the nectar from plants. Right. Which is kind Dale, Dale, I have to say we're there. Um, listen, that was a fantastic hour. Lots and lots and lots of information. Um, now, next, we, next week, next week, bug hunts and trees and a special, special, special treat, which I promised in the very, very first webinar way, way back. OK, OK, I'm curious. I'm looking forward to next <laughs> week's already, Dale. So Me you too. can register and um, we'll post details on our social media pages uh, as before. Um, but we hope that everyone else will join us again. Um, you can re-watch this webinar. Um, that'll be on the Kerry Biosphere website. And um, I'm going to share with you something else. We're going to actually host another series in May. Um, the two biospheres are going to be putting on another set of uh, uh, webinars. Um, we're putting them together now. So if there's anything you really want to know about, really want to learn about, maybe you could let us know. 
um, and we'll see if we can find uh, somebody a bit like Dale who can teach you uh, their their knowledge of well whatever it is that you want to learn about as far as uh, nature and wildlife is concerned. So Dale, um, you've been brilliant, absolutely fantastic again. And listen, we need to get that story published. What's the story called? Patricia the Painted Lady Butterfly. Fantastic. Goes on an amazing journey. Fantastic. Okay, so thanks very much. Eleanor, do you want to say something there? My favourite, my favourite story so far, The Painted Lady. I think that migration is just remarkable for such a tiny, tiny little creature to go all that way. It's really amazing. So thank you so much, Dale, for today. It's been really, really interesting. Goodbye, everybody, and see you next week. Salam. <laughs>